Hello, good evening everybody and welcome here tonight to the second in our panel that we're doing with Q um, in partnership with Rathbones Investment Management to whom we're very grateful and we have this is this as I said this is our second event that we have done in this series and last month we looked at diversity in nature and some of the strange patterns that result because of it in all its extraordinary complexity. Tonight we're going to be tackling something pretty different but incredibly important and that's about the whole subject of regeneration and the subject of young people and their engagement within the climate movement and indeed within interest in climate. Now I cheerfully admit that I am 72, I was born in 1951 so I inherited a really very different world from what our speakers tonight inherited, and indeed an extremely different world from what my grandchildren, who are one years old, are going to inherit. We'll all have different ideas of a new normal. And things like that are super important when it comes to making policy, deciding what we're wanting to get back to, how we're we going to preserve it, how do we talk to each other? How do we find the right languages that stretch across the generations? Because while I absolutely believe that the new generations will do a great deal better than us. There's still a role for all of us in trying to set this set this right. So am I guilty? Yeah, I am, but I do my best to try to put something back. Now, so as I say, we've got four fantastic speakers. They're gonna speak for about five minutes and we're going to try and be fairly tough on time because we wanna have lots more conversations with them and they're all fantastic. And then it'll be over to you. So please put your questions into the Q&A box whenever you think of them. Don't wait until we get to the end of our conversation, which will be in about 45 minutes. So with no further ado, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce our first speaker, who's the author of this, I hope you'll be able to see it the right way around. Uh, Tori Sui is the author of this fantastic book called It's Not Just You. Tori is a climate activist. She was born in Hong Kong. She now lives in Bristol. She's undertaken many interesting journeys across the world on a boat. And indeed, she and I first met in Colombia in Cartagena when she arrived on a false mission to go to the climate talks in Chile that then got moved to Madrid. It was that muddled year. Greta Thunberg is a great supporter of hers. She's an activist. She works on all the good things like Climate Live, Earth Percent, and indeed the campaign to stop the development of the Rosebank oil field. So I'm with great pleasure, no more from me. I'm going to hand over to Tori to talk to us for the next five minutes. And Tori, I'll pop up if you go over the time. So lovely to see you and thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you so much, Rosie. And yes, we did meet at quite an interesting time in my life when, um, as mentioned, the sale to the COP as we called it, had kind of gotten into a bit of a mess with the uh, Chile climate conference being relocated to Madrid. But actually, um, it was during that time that, you know, a lot of my activism was really seeded. I think so much of the lessons that I learned throughout that journey and from being in Colombia with environmental defenders has really shaped me today. And I think the subject of regeneration and renewal is something that I hold very near and dear to me. And as someone who, you know, I would I would call myself a self-proclaimed mycophile and mushroom obsessive, actually a lot of my interest in this subject and a lot of my activism stems from that love for mushrooms. And in the context of something like regeneration, I, I hope these, you know, can kind of provide some guiding points for how you navigate uh, your forms of activism or um, your forms of change making in the world. So regeneration for me is an invitation to replace the old with the new. Um, for instance, like the system before us, which I don't think is compatible with what we would call a climate just future. And we see that like in nature, what breaks down can bring a new. And one of the things that I think is really um, paramount to, to the work that I do is I, I consider a lot on how fungal and microbial systems can actually contribute to this breaking down and creating a new. And I like to think of um, the work by feminist scholar Donna Haraway and this concept that she calls the Tulacine as something that really guides this important message. So the Tulacine is a sort of epoch, as it were. Um, you know, many of us say that we live in the Holocene. Well, the Tulacine is what Donna Haraway describes as something that collects up the trash of the Anthropocene, which is another term that people have given for this period of time that we're in, um, sort of dictated by human influence. 
and the exterminism of the capitalist scene, again, another form of how we view this world um, sort of dominated by the capitalist system. And she says that we need to chip and shred and layer all of these um, sort of elements like a mad gardener and make hot compost piles for still possible past, presents and futures. And for me, that's a really important analogy when we look at kind of how we are to move forward in a time such as now, in a time of breakdown, quite frankly. Um, and, and this is also seen in, you know, the mushroom analogy that writer Adrian Marie Brown talks about where everything that's dead and alive goes into the soil and eventually gets processed into life. Um, and to kind of extend that mushroom analogy further, I'm someone that often sees myself as a bit of a mushroom in the climate movement. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the right spontaneous conditions, we can become visibilized, but also I occupy this sort of forward facing role as a sort of orator and, and a writer in the climate movement. But there are so many mycelial networks and, and people who lay the foundation. Um, and that's a testament to the importance of community in this kind of work. And, you know, a lot of my work also focuses on mental well-being and mental health. And there are two elements that I kind of want to touch on with regard to that. The first is this concept that, you know, we call regen in activist movements. Um, and that is very much part and parcel of this theme of regeneration that we talk about here. And regen is such an important part of the work that we do. It champions joy and rest and time to collect ourselves and really think about the world that we want to create, to live the world that we want to create. Um, and systems of regeneration are so important in mental health because far too often activists suffer from burnout, extreme fatigue. You know, it's not lost on many of us to become very depressed doing the work that we do. And regeneration offers us respite from these difficulties, but also allows us to create something new. And with this mycelial network that I've spoken about in the context of being a mushroom, for instance, I think that there's a lot that can be said about the power of community and collective efforts and how that actually shapes regeneration and renewal. So much of the work that I do and so many, so many things that, you know, most of my comrades do, for instance, wouldn't be possible if we didn't work together, if we didn't transmit signals and create strong collaborative links. And I'm hoping that these are the sorts of tenets that we can carry when it comes to creating change in this world. And these are the things that I have tried to champion in my book that Rosie held up, It's Not Just You, um, which advocates for a form of collective care in lieu of this individualized care that we have been sold in this society and day and age. So that is a very brief introduction to me. <laughs> and I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you. That was really lovely. I, I completely get the idea that it's like the sort of underground mycelium and that if you can build that kind of strength then actually you can grow and achieve everything because community and the mycelium and the fungi are such a strong network so it's a wonderful image thank you so much um our next speaker is phoebe smith and phoebe uh is again another activist but also she she's an adventurer and she is a presenter and a broadcaster and author, a photographer, but she also does extraordinary things with taking people on things like wild nights where you end up sleeping on a beach or under a rock and getting children out into the wild in not just a kind of manicured garden, but something seriously uh, un untouched by humankind. And I think and hope she's going to explain to us why she does it. And following Phoebe is going to be her partner, Dwayne Fields. And I know they've both come back from just launching a film which is about we, their, their company is called We Too, and this is about We Too and adventure. So Phoebe, thank you, and over to you. Oh, thank you, Rosie. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's really good to be here. And um, and hearing Tori um, talk just that, I'm, I'm utterly inspired. I love all her, um, her metaphors to explain um, the kind of things that she's doing. My story is a little bit different. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. You already heard kind of what I do, but... I grew up in North Wales, um, about 20 miles from Snowdonia National Park, which many of you probably have heard of. For me, though, it may well have been 2,000 miles away. I had no way of getting there. Public transport was, was very bad. Um, I didn't have an understanding of rights, of where I could walk, what I could do. Um, I couldn't afford expensive outdoor kit. 
and um, I, I, it was an area I lived in which was known by the National Trust as Costa del Dole, such high unemployment that we had in them. Um, quite, you know, quite a, a place that not many people wanted to be from. And um, I, I continuously was told the outdoors was not a place for me. Um, I'm obviously older than Tori. And um, when I grew up, there certainly weren't any female role models like me. I remember very vaguely when I was very little, um, there was a climber called Alison Hargreaves who uh, went, who was climbing all these mountains and she sadly died on K2. And I remember there was this uproar that how dare she go and leave her children. Um, <clears throat> and I remember even though I was really young thinking it was strange that no one ever said that to any of the male mountaineers, but that, that was how it was. And, um, you know, I would tell people I wanted to go and do something and, and, and have an adventure. And, and it was kind of like, people like us don't do this. You know, I, I couldn't, shouldn't or wouldn't do it. Um, years later, I was signing on the dole. Um, I was sleeping on friends couches and I'd lost my mum to cancer and I decided life is short and I wanted to get out there and see the world and so I got a job in the pub I worked every shift I could and I saved and then I traveled I literally got as far away as possible I went to Australia uh, and I experienced for the first time a night out literally out in in nothing more than a sleeping bag in the middle of the red center the outback and I remember the guide I had with me telling me about all the things that could have killed me because anyone who's been to the um, outback in Australia will know that's a familiar thing you're told when you go there and I was absolutely terrified but I had the most incredible night seeing the stars come out hearing the um the animals seeing the animals come really close and waking up in the morning and it felt like the sunrise was just for me and hearing the birds start singing and it was incredible and um, it something switched in me. And when I got home, I still had very little money, but I discovered there was a thing called wild camping, which you could do with it's free, which is pitching up away from a campsite. I'd much rather be away from the, the, the very sort of rigid pictures of campsite. And you go and make your own bed. So the mountains can be your headboard and the grass can be your mattress. And you can pretty much go wherever you want as long as you do it responsibly. And <clears throat> I decided to do my first solo wild camp in Snowdonia and everyone told me that everything would go wrong that I would be mugged or attacked because I was a woman on my own or I'd be eaten by a bear despite this being Wales and um, <clears throat> I did it anyway and things did go wrong I got sunburnt ran out of water eaten alive by midges got a tick on me but when I caught sight of my sunburnt midge bitten face in the rearview mirror I realized the cataclysmic shift had occurred and I realized I could be that role model I never had. I could tell people that we could all do this. I'm not a great athlete, but I can do this wild camping. And so I decided I would write books and articles and present and take photos and really encourage everyone to get involved. I did more adventures, more extreme camping, all in the natural world. And I started to notice the change even in my lifetime of species disappearing of areas that were quite wild trees being cut down of more and more encroachment on the natural world um and i and i wanted to tell people about it and so i did through my articles and books but I, then i wanted to give back so i started to work with um center point a young people's homeless charity and i did a lot of sleep outs, extreme sleep outs, dangling from porter ledges um, off cliff faces. Um, and I became an ambassador for them for their extreme sleep outs and raised over 42,000. And the more I did these kind of things, the more my confidence grew and the more successful I became in my sort of working life, if you, uh, if you want to see it that way, writing and uh, photographing and broadcasting, that I became more successful there. And I wanted more people to know this because I grew up in an area where you didn't think about climate change or nature because it was such an alien concept because people just didn't have much. And it is a bit of a privileged position, I think, to, to, to know and think about these things. And I, I don't believe when you reach a certain level that you should pull the ladder up behind you. I believe you should extend the ladder and get more people up with you. Um, and that's really why I set up the We Too Foundation, the charity with, with my teammate, Dwayne. Um, and, and you'll hear his story after mine. But basically, we wanted to work with underprivileged young people between the ages of 16 and 19 to show them that nature and the outdoors is for them. We wanted to give them the kit they need. We wanted to empower them to make them get that connection with the natural world, like I've done, as Rosie said, uh, like I've done with other young people before I worked with Dwayne. 
and when I've taken grown-ups even from inner city out into the wilderness and people from rural areas because there's like I said growing up in North Wales you'd have thought I'd have been very outdoorsy but I wasn't because I didn't know what to do and I didn't have the kit so we're trying to remove the barriers to give the young people a voice um, and to plant seeds of hope in some of the most deprived areas in the UK and um, so far <laughs> we've we've done our first big expedition we took um, a group of young people on a carbon negative expedition to Antarctica uh, a year ago now uh, and uh, and we just released the documentary uh, showed it at Kendall Mountain Festival and uh, looking to, to show it in more places soon so you'll hear from Joy next but that's my story of who I am and, and how I got here. That was a wonderful story thank you that was fantastic I, I appear to say that probably Alison Hargreaves might get back to the same reception today how, how dare you go and climb a mountain when you're meant to be at home with the kids but um, yeah. it's interesting you bring her up i thought about that story a lot it was so um it was so brutal how uh, the world yeah. treated her I thought um Definitely. anyway we're now going to move on to Dwayne Fields who is Phoebe's uh partner uh not partner partner but you know partner in the business that they run together Dwayne grew up in a very different circumstances in a completely urban environment he also has the extraordinary distinction of being the first black person to walk to the North Pole. I think it was 400 miles. He appears on Country File. He's a tremendous advocate for involving young people in issues of nature and climate. And we couldn't have a better person to join us tonight. So Dwayne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. Um, so my story starts many, many years ago back in Jamaica. And I was born in a really rural part of Jamaica. So around my four walls, breeze block house. Uh, we didn't have running water, didn't have gas, didn't have electricity. But what we did have was lots of natural spaces around us, whether it was fields or forests or woodlands. And I remember even as a three-year-old kid, having all the freedom to go and utilize that space um, as I saw fit. And it was a great space for me to use to push myself, learn where and how to be confident, uh, learn what to eat and what not to eat. I made many mistakes. Um, and, you know, I was six years old and I and I moved to the UK. So my beginnings in life was very much in a natural environment and I shifted to an urban one. And I remember really struggling, which is a complete um, opposite to a lot of young people in particular who grew up in places like London or Manchester or Birmingham or any of these big cities. Um, you take them out of that environment and for the most part, they are lost because it's very foreign to them. And it was the same thing for me, just the city was a really difficult place for me to be because I didn't know anything. I didn't know um, what you could and couldn't do. I didn't know what the rules were. And in fact, there's, there's there were pictures of me going around on the internet somewhere where when I first came to the United Kingdom, um, I didn't realize that it wasn't the done thing to go and take animals from their, from their nests. And there's a, you know, a young squirrel pup that I'm holding. And again, that was just one of the errors that I made in my earliest, earliest days being here in the UK. Fast forward to growing up in East London, and many of you listening now may, may be aware of what life was like in East London back in the 90s or in the, the, the noughties. It was a very, very tough place. And it was even harder in, in, in if you grew up with very little money or very little resources like I did. And I remember actually that there was an incident that happened where my life was in serious danger. A gun was pulled. And um, that to me was a wake up call. It, it felt like something saying to me, go back to my first love. And that was always going to be nature and the outdoors. And I thought, well, actually, I benefited a lot from the outdoors. What can I do to help other people benefit from that as well? And I started working with young people from about 2006, just as a volunteer teacher in a school. And I found that I was really passionate about it. I love the fact that I had something that I could teach. And since then, I've gone on to take people on expeditions. Um, well, uh, like Phoebe said a moment ago, all over the world, as well as here in the United Kingdom. I've taken lots of groups out, uh, young people in particular, and there's something that drives me on every single time I take a group out. It's that moment where we stop and we pause and we're in a completely uh, natural environment and everyone starts to look around for a moment and wonder why we've stopped and I don't say anything. And then the cherry drops. They realize that they can't hear the buses or they can't hear their phones or they can't hear cars and sirens and that smile starts to creep up their face and they realize that they're allowed to smile and they don't have to put on a front to be tough and they don't have to know everything to to thrive in this environment they realize that actually i'm just a kid and i can be a kid and it's not dangerous it's not harming me 
uh, this is actually a very natural place for me to be. And the more I did that was the more I felt like it was necessary because I realized for every one kid I took out, there's probably five or six million more that will never get that experience. And again, that's why Phoebe and I formed the V2 Foundation. So we could spread that experience to as many people as possible. And equally, I realized that I loved the outdoors. My very first environment was the outdoors. Um, I wanted that passion to spread to other people. And I always felt if I want to be 80, 90 years old, uh, looking at the world and be able to comment on it, if I didn't do something to try and make it better, I'd be sitting there as a hypocrite. So for me, it was always about getting young people out into the outdoors. And if they were out there, I was convinced they would fall in love with it. And if they fell in love with it, I was even more convinced they would work to protect it. Equally, I was that kid in class who would sit there looking outside the window. I wasn't interested in what was on the board. I was always more interested in what was happening outside, why the trees were blowing, what birds those were flying past. And I found it difficult to sit in the classroom and focus. And I think there were so many young people out there just like that, who, you know, every single study, whether it's a Natural England study or a Marmot in 2014 study, it shows that if young people in particular, but this is across the board, spend time learning in a natural environment, they retain the information um, longer, they absorb more information, their health is improved, every, their, their mental health is improved, every single aspect of who and what they are improves uh, generally when they spend time outdoors. So for me, that's why I've been a passionate advocate, spending time outdoors and doing more to protect the environments that we have and keeping them as natural as possible. Thank you, Drain. Thank you. Thank you very much. You said so many, um, so many wonderful and interesting things. And um, yeah, your story is is very powerful about how that reconnection really helped. Um, I think it does for all of us if we can just have access to it. Now, our last speaker tonight uh, is from Q. Claire Howard is a, a qualified teacher, and she she's been doing that for fifteen years, and she runs the the Q. Um, the Q education and youth work, which encourages people to come and find Q in all that means and to find the great outdoors. Um, I can tell you she's got a fantastic background on her on her Zoom, which we're all very envious of. Claire, good evening and thank you for being with us tonight. Over to you. Hi, thank you, Rosie. It's so great to be here. Um, yeah, it was really interesting listening to, to Dwayne speak as well about um, his experiences taking young people out into the natural world and um, watching them relax in that space and, and feel more themselves. Um, and I think what I want to speak to you a little bit today is about my work at Q, um, running Q's youth program and the programs that we run that help to kind of platform youth voice at the same time as building that connection to nature um, and that sense of belonging as well. Um, but I grew up just south of Manchester, very near to the airport. And I think um, what's really important in, in my memory is this first experience for me of kind of nature activism and realizing the importance of nature um, because we were protesting at that time against uh, Manchester Airport's second runway. Um, and I remember really clearly uh, one, my first experience of being on the local news, which was very exciting. Um, but secondly, this experience of passing food through the railings to these climate activists that were um, living in the trees surrounding Manchester Airport to stop them being chopped down. Um, and I remember when we got the news that uh, the airport was going to continue to build this second runway on the green belt um, near to where I lived. And the disappointment and frustration that I felt um, as a, as a seven-year-old um, that this was happening despite all the effort that we, I, had put in at that time. Um, and then when I moved into uh, adolescence, nature for me became more of a space of respite. Um, and this is something that we hear from young people quite a lot in our work, this idea of nature as an ego-free space, this relaxation that Dwayne was talking about. Um, because for me, as a, as a queer teenager, growing up in a really gendered world, I was I was really uh, struggling to find my place within it. Um, and that freedom away from those societal expectations was huge for me as a teenager um, and, and something that I, I'm really passionate about expanding to, to other young people that I work with. I then moved on to be a, a secondary school teacher for a number of years in North East London. Um, and it was there that I started setting up the Duke of Edinburgh Award um, in the school that I was working in. 
And I don't think I realized until that point, the value, uh, the true value of taking young people out into the natural world um, and, and giving them that space to explore. Um, and it was really quite transformative for the young people that we were working with, a lot of them struggling with behavioral issues um, within the, the four walls of the classroom. Um, this idea of like looking outside. And I think a lot of that's about curiosity. Education for me should be a place that fosters curiosity, but I think uh, more often than not, sadly, um, that isn't always the case. And allowing young people the freedom to explore independently, and I think this is what's really important about these Duke of Edinburgh expeditions, is that they are often for the first time trusted to be independent and have the responsibility of finding their way from point A to point B um, with their peers. And they will make mistakes and they will go the wrong way. Um, but not only are they building that rapport with their peers in those moments, but they're also building rapport um, with the nature that's around them. That led me on to um, completing my mountain leader qualification that would allow me to take young people on expeditions um, further afield in the mountainous areas of the country. Um, and it was at that point uh, when I was completing my training that I, I truly realized the, the singularity of the demographic in these spaces. Um, it's a very cis, white, straight male space. Um, and that's a huge problem because how are the diversity of our urban living young people ever going to feel like that space is for them if they're not reflected in the young people that are, are in, in the people that are working there? Um, that eventually led me to Q, um, where my youth program's aim is to nurture tomorrow's environmental leaders. Um, and what we want to foster is a diverse space um, that is inclusive and trains up the environmental leaders of tomorrow to be um, more diverse and reflective of, of, of the young people in our urban environments today. Um, we work with a very specific age range. I think when we talk about young people, sometimes we're talking 14 to 30, 14 to 25. We work specifically with 14 to 17, and, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, I think they're a fantastic um, age group to work with. But we know that at that age, there is an adolescent dip in nature connection um, that, that is quite profound. Um, it's in the research and alongside that and wanting to bridge that gap, it's also a time when young people are making really important choices about their future. Um, at the same time as becoming quite aware of the world around them and starting to critique it um, and, and starting to think about um, that people in positions of power that are um, making decisions that don't always reflect or involve um, them, either on a micro level in their schools or, or on a more macro level in, in government. Um, and I think it's really important to know how perceptive young people are to feelings of injustice um, and the cognitive dissonance that happens quite a lot in these climate conversations of, of promises and pledges that are happening um, and, and potentially the behavior and, and the policy not, not reflecting that, um, definitely not reflecting it um, at enough speed and urgency. So when we say environmental leaders, one of the purposes of our programs is that although we know that we're in a unique position at Q uh, to offer world leading experiences and exposure to, to scientists and researchers at the forefront of conservation and biodiversity loss, we want to make sure that we're doing that in tandem uh, with platforming youth voice and offering them the opportunity to feel heard and respected and valued um, for the opinions that they have. And so our programs are um, involve science communication as well as um, citizen science. And, and both of these things are not just about passively absorbing information, being passive learners, they're about being active citizens. Um, and we know that if you give young people the opportunity to feel empowered and, and motivated and that they are um, enacting change, they are more likely to go on um, and become social agents of social change um, in the future as well. Um, for us, this is a climate justice issue. Um, when, we, when we talk about um, issues of, of the climate crisis, it's not just about the planet, but also the people involved. And, and we know that those people that are being disproportionately affected by it are often those that haven't caused it and this involves youth but also people in the global south as well um and so yeah a lot of our programs are about harboring this sense of belonging 
um, within the programs that will connect young people to nature as well as to each other. Thanks. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you. I'm sorry for popping up, but I want <laughs> to get on to the conversation. But that was actually totally riveting. I, I had no idea about that there was a sort of dip away from nature in that crucial period. Um, I'd love to read more about it. That's really fascinating. So will everyone turn their cameras back on so that we're all in the conversation? And uh, Tori, let me come back to you because Claire touched on it and I think we're all touching on it, the questions of climate justice. And also, mm -hmm. uh, I think you raise in your book, um, you know, sometimes this feeling that, that outdoor space is a kind of luxury. Um, mm. that you have to be a rich, well-off country in order to sort of appreciate it. How do, how, do we, how do we go forward with that? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think all of the speakers have have touched on that really well, especially, you know, those who are trying to cre create equity and access in the outdoor space. It's so important. Um, but also, I think we, we forget that those often who have the closest ties to nature tend to be those who either kind of grow up around it or folks who may identify as being indigenous with the land. Um, I think so many of my friends, specifically in the Global South, some of whom I met in Colombia, um, have a very mm -hmm. profound connection to nature. But it's not just this connection to nature as we see it here in the West. It's very much part of their um, their knowledge system if we would call it that, their ontology, so to speak. And that very much understands that they are fundamentally a part of the ecosystem in which they live um, to the point that it's imbued in their language, in the way that they interact. Um, and I feel like part of the reason why these elements of connectivity to the land are not so apparent here in the UK is because there is a disparity in who has access to the outdoors and who has the luxury of, you know, accessing green space. And in the subject of climate justice, we do see that those who are least likely to have access to these spaces tend to be from black and brown and low income communities. Um, and it's it's very apparent in urban areas as well, especially with high levels of air pollution um, that kind of correspond with either say a lack of green space, but also being in proximity to what we call sacrifice zones where a lot of pollution takes place. Mm -hmm. So as you know, we advocate for climate justice, we also have to recognize that being in proximity and with nature is a human right. And I feel like until we get to that point, we won't be able to create these connections that allow us to see ourselves as fundamentally part of nature as well. Yes, I think that that's very true. That we have we have put such a, such a big space between us and a kind of and a field or a hedge or whatever it is. I mean, how how do uh, Phoebe? How do you feel that when how do children or young people react when you give them the chance to see something different than a concrete wall? I mean, <clears throat> it it does so much. I mean, do I mention before about the, the the stopping and pausing and having that minute to just realize that. It's quiet, but it's not just quiet. There's life there. A lot of them have this thing of, oh, there's nothing there. There's this thing, there's nothing there. Whereas actually there's loads there. And um, I mean, by what I did uh, pre We Two Foundation, which is taking people for just a single night out in the outdoors, you know, some of them have never even taken a minute to look up and see the stars. Some of them can't see the stars if they've come from the city where light pollution is a massive thing. Um, and, or, or they've never heard an owl you know, they've only ever heard it as a sound effect on a video or something. They didn't know. It's like they actually do make a noise and it, and it is real and it's going on there. And, um, you know, I even took a friend of mine who was who's in their 40s. Um, I took her out for a first wild camp and she was like, I didn't realise we could see planets from, mm. from Earth. Like, I didn't realise we could do that without a telescope. And I, I just think, yeah, we've, we've kind of put so much focus on owning a thing that we've got very disconnected. And it's like Tori said, you know, you, you speak to indigenous peoples like, like the Inuit in Canada and they don't even talk about themselves as being from a place. They are of the place. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's a, it's a massive, it's a massive thing. And, and the problem we face, of course, which we've seen, you know, for, and I've written about quite recently is that we've had a, a former now environment secretary who's, um, whose issue was that the cows should have more right to roam than people and private land should be private land and access shouldn't be for all. And this is in a country where we have access in England to only 8% of the entire land. That's the, the only amount we have the legal right to access. That's tiny. And, you know, we had the case in Dartmoor where we had um, yep. 
uh, an investment banker, Darwell, who um, who took the case to court to try and throw out the legal right to wild camp, even though he owns land that's the same size as the island of Gibraltar. Um, you know, there's a huge disparity, and, and that's why I touched on before. You know, it's why me and Dwayne do what we do. It's 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 okay when you've got something to say no one should have that right but actually if we want people to fall in love with something and we want them to fight to protect it and fall in love with it we've got to give them access to it we've got to allow them that connection that's really important um Dwayne do you think that you can get this into urban environments because I mean more and more of us are living in cities rather than living in the countryside and indeed I mean what's it now 60 percent of the global population is in an urban area how do we change those urban areas well just to throw another stat in there about two or three percent of the uk is paved over now when you live in a city that could feel like a huge amount of the uk but going back to what phoebe said if we could get more access or allow people to recognize the access that they actually have and maybe even start utilizing the small green spaces at the end of your road or at the you know by the park if the more we start using those i think we're going to find individuals in these communities urban communities who think actually I really enjoyed going to the corner there. I really enjoyed <laughs> that bit of grass and figuring out what insects at what and you know seeing the 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 um the food chain in that one square foot of grass. I wonder what else is out there. And I think that's what we're trying to get to is planting that seed or sparking that interest. And I think when you when you look at every single study, I'm gonna go back to this. Every single study I've read that's showed people, not just young people, every single study I've read that talks about people learning in the outdoors. They all say it's better for us. And I think we need to do more within schools to get more young people uh, to learn outdoors. Every school that I go to, more often than not, I should say, the green field, their wild or natural spaces is paved over. And I think, what a waste. What an absolute waste. I, I just, I, for me, it's, it's a no-brainer. If you learn better, retain more, um, learn faster, you increase in your sense of positive outlook you reduce in your levels of stress, your behavior improves, every aspect, like I said before, improves when you learn in a natural space. We have become so disconnected from nature. When we go out in nature, we can identify a threat or a friend or a foe based on how birds call. It's only over the last 150 years that we've become so disconnected, the last six generations. And I think that still lives in us somewhere. When we go out, you hear pigeons flapping suddenly. It mm -hmm. makes you kind of look because that's something that we've learned to identify over millennia. And we now think that that's not part of us. It absolutely is. And just like Phoebe said, in some parts of the world, they still recognize that they are not separate mm -hmm. from nature. They are one bit of it. And I remember being a kid and thinking, actually, it was very natural for me to be in these green natural spaces. I didn't feel out of place. I didn't feel like I was an addition. I felt like I was absolutely part of it. And I think there is a benefit, or I, I think I get a level of arrogance from it, if I'm honest. I feel like I have, um, I've got a cheat code because I experienced nature at such a young age and I got so much out of it. And I, I feel like I genuinely have a cheat code for life because of that. And I think there are so many young people missing out who could benefit and go on to benefit their peers. So Claire, as a teacher, what do you think we should do with the education system? I think Big a lot question. of- Sure big does. question. There, there are lots of answers to that question. But um, in, in, in context to, to what we're talking about at the moment, I think what we see is um, so many overworked teachers in an underfunded sector, um, many of whom have lots of dreams and desires as to things that they would like to be able to offer the young people within their, within their classrooms and within their schools. Um, but unfortunately, we're working with an exam factory that doesn't offer mm -hmm. the space um, and doesn't value in, in, the, in the same way um, these opportunities. Were you going to say something? <laughs> no, but no, that, that's a very good answer. What I'm going to do is come to Tori now because we're coming up to the climate talks in the Middle East, uh, which are bizarrely being chaired by the person who also runs ADNOC, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Uh, which, uh, according to all reports in the last two weeks, has wildly overshot its uh, production of crude oil um, if it was going to have any hope of staying within the 1.5 agreements that were signed in Paris. So that makes me a bit depressed. Um, what do you want to see coming out of something like COP? Do you feel that it's an institution that speaks to you at all, or is it just the world grinding on like the world grinds on? 
That's a great question. And um, it's something that I reckon with year after year after year, which I think should be an indicator of kind of how I see the processes and, and what that means for many of us who've been engaging with these, these conferences for quite a while. Um, you know, it's really interesting because um, most of my work revolving around the COPs tries to create access for those who have been historically excluded, mm -hmm. um, those who have previously not been able to attend due to economic mm -hmm. um, and social uh, in injustices. And, you know, it is still of their interest to attend and engage with the dialogues, because for many of them, this could mean the difference between, um, quite frankly, life or death, um, for them to make vital connections for people in their communities, many of whom are Indigenous. And when we have discussions as a team to reflect on the extent to which it's worth it, I think on an individual level, some people definitely walk away and feel like they've made some strides. But on a global level, we're still not seeing the change that we need to see. Um, and quite frankly, you know, with someone like Sultan Al Jaber heading up the um, mm. the COP, this really begs the question, are we still just trying to hold on to the same system that's gotten us into this mess? You know, we've seen previously, for instance, with WHO conferences, they used to have the heads of tobacco companies um, running these conferences until they said, you know what, you're just providing them a space to continue with their agenda. Um, and I feel very similarly with something like the COP. I think we're allowing these companies to greenwash. I think this is also an instance where we give them a social license or rather a social yeah. credibility to continue existing because they feel part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and it was actually Christiana Figueres who used mm -hmm. to be um, sort of the head of these processes who came out with a letter and said, I used to believe that the oil and gas companies could change. I was wrong. Um, and that just goes to show that years and years and years of diplomacy and negotiations have led somebody who's been deeply embedded in these processes yeah. to say, I have worked on this for years and they won't change. They won't budge. Um, and I think that says it all. That's not to say that there isn't a point in sort of engaging. For, like I said, for many people, this is a really important space um, on a personal level. You know, I, I I do get quite disillusioned when I go into the spaces, but and it's it's one of those things where you feel sad, but you're not surprised at the outcome. Yep. Um, yep. And so the antithesis to that, I think, for many organizers would be to create pressure and organize at a grassroots level, because that we have control over that we know can lead to some real concrete change. Yeah, that's that's a very, very, very good answer. Um, Please send in your questions because I'm going to come to them in. Oh, I realize it's nearly quarter past. Um, Phoebe, what do you want to see our government do? Oh, my goodness. I mean, that's a massive question. Especially I know it is, but <laughs> given that it's really difficult getting things to change, what would you it see? Really the, the problem is not just with our government, but with all with with society in general has been so fixated on growth. Yeah. and not the growth of trees and plants yeah. that we actually do rely on it's we can't just keep having growth for growth's sake because it's it's killing us it's literally killing the planet and us and they and we just seem to be ruled by people that just want to get richer and make more money they'll never touch rather than actually providing a planet for our future generations to live on um which is just baffling but they need to get engaged with this argument they need to stop kind of just I'm trying to say it in a nice way, they need to stop just kind of dismissing protesters as a certain woke crowd. Mm -hmm. They need mm -hmm. to actually listen. You know, they keep saying about being led by science, but they're blatantly looking science they're in not. the face and going, let's let more oil fields be drilled for. Like, it doesn't really make any sense. So I think, like like we said, I, it's like what Tori just said, you, you want to engage people in the conversation because we've all got to talk about it to make it work. We can't just be in our own fraction saying about what needs to be done. Everyone's got to communicate. But until we can break the mindset of growth for growth's sake and making more money, and everything's got to grow economically rather than just growing as people, as a planet, it's very difficult to know how to make them change it because someone in that position has to get it and have to has to care and has to want to change it. And I do think that it is engaging with younger people because, you know, I'm sure every one of us here yeah, we've been out there with people that, and we can see it with our own eyes over even just a few years, the changes that are happening. The fact that when I was a kid, you could 
drive um, on a summer holiday in a car with your parents and the, the windshield would be covered in bugs. I know that sounds horrible, but they would be. No. Now there's nothing. There's nothing there. And that's just a very simple way to go, where the hell have all the, where's all the insects gone? Where's all the, you know, I'm not hearing the birds sing as much anymore. Like what's going on? And and if no one will engage and listen and, and actually listen to the people, the people who are, we're, you know, who we're giving the world to, you know, there's a wonderful uh, saying that we don't inherit the earth. We we borrow it from our children. And I, and I think someone that's been lost in all this growth talk. We've forgotten that it's not ours to destroy. And yet it's just being destroyed all the time. I c couldn't agree with you more. And I think that you can you can track it to the whole era of colonialism. Uh, the idea that you can have dominion over nature, that you can control it, and that it's ours free to use. Um, I have so many questions for you all. Um, Dwayne, do you think that, um, on that note, do you think that there is a point in putting financial value on nature, the, the idea of natural capital, that uh, we talk about, you know, whether it's carbon credits or what we get, I mean, like, you know, we, we take it for granted the air, the soil, the water, all these things that go to make up all these products, as Phoebe was talking about, this endless growth. And yet we have never paid for it. Could we pay for it? I think I think there's people that argue, yes, that's a great idea. But I think what will end up happening are the have nots will then yeah. suffer even more than they are suffering now. Um, I think when you look at places like the Amazon and the river basin now is as dry as it's ever been in recorded times. Um, it, it means when you think of the nutrient cycle, that's going to slow down as a result. There are people around the world that are suffering because of one incident happening a world away. And if we were to put a financial, I don't know, price on it, they couldn't afford it. They can't afford the changes and the destruction that they've been faced with now. And if we increase it and add a tax on it, then those with will just continue to do what they're doing and it won't slow them down because they have the money, they have the resources, they have the means to escape the results of what's happened. Now, I've never been big on blaming anyone, but we've known about the, the impact that we can have on the climate since around the 1935, 1940, thereabouts, we knew that the carbon impacts the environment. We've done nothing. The people in power, the people, the resources have either hidden this or carried on pumping out. If you think back to the 80s when everyone was uh, talking about the ozone layer, I haven't heard the word ozone for easily 10 years now. And that was because of the you know CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons mm -hmm. from fridges. Everyone just went, bought new fridges, and now we've got the old fridges in the developing world. It's, it's just, I think if we did that, we'd be kicking the can to the people who can least afford it. And I think that's unfair. I think what we need to do is just maybe touch on what Phoebe said is... We need to start valuing this more and getting the people that make the decisions to value nature and stop valuing, you know, increasing their value by 2% here and there. And, you know, they've got a billion, they need to get two. They have two, we need to get four. We have four, hey, let's make it to 10. That mentality. Do you know, do, do you know sorry to just interrupt, I'm just thinking like Come in. the headlines today were showing, um, I don't know if you saw The Guardian today, the, the headlines about the, the most polluting people, like the 10 individuals, make up 66%. You know, I'd love to see that before a politician should could get in power, that they would have to come out and spend a, spend a few nights wild camping in somewhere and walk across the land and actually immerse themselves into nature. I think they are, the millionaires that people Dwayne was just talking about, are, are even more disconnected than everyone else. They think they have nature because they brought this swathe of wild landscape, but actually make them spend some time with it. Make them actually understand what's going on and what's happening because I think it, there's just something about you remember that program that would take a boss of a company yes. to go and work at a grassroots level to yes. actually see what was going on I think that's what we need of our politicians I think we need our leaders to get them out of the office with all the security and all the mod cons and actually get them back to nature to actually appreciate what's going on and, and see it with their own eyes because at the moment it just the conversations aren't working I think they need to like we're saying, young people need to immerse in it to protect it, to fall in love with it. Why not do that and, and ask that of our leaders that they have to take the time to do that? I quite agree. I think it's a really good point. It's the same that all people should have jobs before they come into politics and preferably all people should get fired at least once because it <laughs> certainly wakes you up to some realities. Um, Claire, coming back to you, I'm now going to start taking some questions from the audience, which are 
coming in thick and fast. What is Q planning for the Department of Education sustainability strategy, new GCSEs? Has the, do you think that's going to be good? Um, we've spoken a lot about the natural history GCSE that's coming out. It's been um, involved in a lot of botanic garden education networks and conferences. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for it. At the moment, there is a dearth of um, kind of botany and mycology focused um, courses for young people um, to take part in. And we have a huge and really successful schools program as well that sees a lot of key stage four and five students coming to us uh, to participate in conservation practice as well. And it's one of the programs um, that I run on my That's youth great. program. Um, we've also just recently set up uh, a Young Environmental Leaders Award to kind of complement that um, it's something that we're really proud of, uh, this idea of not only are the young people participating in an environmental project um, that connects them closer to, to their surrounding environment and hopefully in their uh, surrounding areas as well, so that they're, they're looking at the nature that is close to them rather than this idea that nature has to be without and further away. Um, that's not always the case at all. Um, but it also develops them on a kind of personal and social level uh, along these line nine leadership qualities as well. Um, something to look out for. That's great. Doc. I'm sorry, I failed to credit that question back to Kim Polgreen, but thank you for it. Now, Jessica Boltena, this is a really interesting question, I think for Tori, but I'd be interested in what everyone says. What would you think of as an alternative to COP? Um, is there a sort of something, I mean, she's saying it is an effort way above the local level essentially ineffective, or is the organiser is it the organiser and the motivations that are dysfunctional? I mean, is there something that we can do that's in the middle? That's a really great, great question, because mm. I think so often um, the way that we are globally united behind the climate crisis is when we talk about 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement. And, you know, um, someone like Christiana Figueres has been instrumental in in making sure that it's it's part of that global conversation. Um, you know what, it's it's interesting because on the one hand, people say we need to keep 1.5 alive. We need to do it within the framework that has been provided. It's our best chance. And then there are many others who are saying, actually, no, we need to really start to localize these problems um, and, and the solutions to them as well. But unfortunately, if we look at the main culprits behind the climate crisis, um, they tend to be big oil and gas who are not held accountable. And in fact, we don't even see fossil fuels being mentioned in the Paris Agreement, which is quite frankly outrageous in many ways. Um, and so we need some sort of governing body to hold these to account. So the one um, organization that I kind of want to reference here is the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. Mm -hmm. They are targeting ministerial level, uh, governmental level, um, national level and international level, uh, different folks who want to contribute and, and make sure that we aren't you know, um, not proliferating the expansion of fossil fuels and we're phasing out rapidly. This is kind of modeled on the, the sort of um, nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And I think that if we can start to have these sorts of frameworks in place, then we stand a much better chance of having success in processes like COP. But until we kick the polluters out, it's just not really something that I think will be feasible. Um, they're going to continue to have their lobbyists in these conferences. Uh, and, you know, for me, the way that I've found solace in this time is by organizing at the grassroots level. You mentioned the Stop Rosebank campaign to stop the Rosebank oil field in the North Sea. Um, you know, we had success with stopping the Cambo oil field. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would hope that we have success with stopping Rosebank as well. Yeah, um, and that has been completely grassroots led. Um, and so that's kind of what's giving me hope at the moment. I'm going to ask you all about hope at the end, but... Um... Dwayne, if I if I ask you the same question, how do you how do you see the best way that um, young people, people like you, people younger than you, can can get their voices heard? I mean, you know, I I sit in somewhere in Westminster, and um, we have a group called Peers for the Planet, and we we aim to try to put climate legislation into every single piece of legislation. But you know, quite often we're putting in bits of legislation that seem so. Now, so far away from the, the scope of the problem, um, trying, for instance, I failed to get through an amendment saying that we will stop funding illegal deforestation through any of our companies in the UK. Failed, failed. And then you look outside the window of the world and you see this, particularly this year, which as Amitav Ghosh says, this has been the great unraveling for climate. And you think, what do I do here? What, what, how do we all work together? 
Well, it's it's that thing where you want to keep hope alive, and it's hard not to. Some it's hard to do that sometimes. When you look outside and you hear everyone's talking about everything that you you, you know everything except what you you know to be important. There's a quote that I live by, and it's most of life's failures are people who give up before they realize how close they were to success. And I live behind that because really every great. single day I wake up and I think, do you know what? Maybe today is the day that someone will, it will click in someone's head, the person that makes the decisions. The trouble is every single day it doesn't click. And every single day I go to bed thinking, right, tomorrow I'm going to do more. And I think what we have to do is just hold these young people in to high regard because we know that the more tools we give them, the more likely mm -hmm. they are to succeed where past politicians have failed and past leaderships failed because that's fundamentally what this is. It's a failure of leadership, isn't it? And I Completely. think we have people like Claire and Tori and, and Phoebe and all the other people behind them talking to these young people and sharing the outcome, the fallout of failure, the more likely they are to success and not follow the path that other people walked on. Um, you, you said you said it a minute ago, Rosie. You said you were born in 1952. You don't look it. Well, that's very nice of you, actually. Yes. Yeah, I was born in 51. But I mean, I you know, I can say that yeah. in my dad's garden, yes. every hedge, you just yes. had to lie on the grass and look up in the hedge and you'd see a bird's nest. It, that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, and it's that's a, part of the disconnect, isn't it? We, hmm. we need people like your voice. And this is where I say, it's not about pointing fingers and say your generation did this or that generation. It's about you sharing your experience and bringing more young people, more people into the fold. And I keep saying young people, but I think this is, this is a problem that's gonna take every single one of us to put our shoulders to the wheel hmm. if we're gonna tackle it properly. We clearly can't count on the billionaire oil giant owners, um, CEO leadership. Many of the world's countries are now backpedaling on the weak agreements they made at COP26. Um, they're rolling it back, saying, "Oh well, you know, we had a, we had a, we had COVID, and this is the reason why we have to roll back." And you know, so we clearly can't rely on them. So this is clearly something, like Tori said, for grassroots um, to to pick up the slack and start spreading the word and making sure that we all have it in our head that we have one tiny little blue marble in the middle of a, you know, two hundred trillion billion star cosmos. Why can't we just take a moment, take a breath and say, this is what we need to do. Let's get it done. Yes, well, I completely agree with you about that. So I'm afraid we're sort of coming up to time, but I've, we've got a nice quote from um, one of Greta Thunberg's essays about the future, um, where she says, hope is something you have to earn. So I want to ask you all what hope means to you. Um, Claire, starting with you, what does hope mean to you? What does it practically mean? I think hope um, for me and from the perspective of working so closely with young people is all about empowerment and being mm -hmm. able to feel empowered. Um, there was a really lovely quote that came up um, for me the other day that it kind of is the antithesis of this, which is like cynicism is just another term for obedience. Um, and it's almost as if if we if we do let apathy take over, if we do let uh, cynicism take 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 its toll, then that's what they the, the great they mm -hmm. want want from us um they don't want us to keep forcing and um and trying to enact change so for me it's about empowerment that's great tori i always think that hope is an active stance and i think that that kind of falls quite similar to what greta was saying that it's something you have to earn and i think that when we try and have a sense of hope it has to be cultivated um, and mm -hmm. I think we have to be active citizens and seeing the change mm -hmm. that we want in the world. So for me, it's um, it's a plea to take action. That's really good. Phoebe. I'd say that um, there's a there's a phrase that we we don't need everyone doing uh, sustainability perfectly. We, we don't need a small number of people doing sustainability perfectly. We need everyone doing it imperfectly. And that's kind of the hope that I take. And I think that me and Dwayne take with our We Too Foundation of, of working with young people, we'd love to, to make everyone fall in love with it, but we can't, but we can do these 10 young people each yeah. year and take them and help them. And, and that's the thing, it's like, we all have that power of hope. And, and if we can just plant that seed of hope in one other person that can then plant it in one other person, that is starting a huge network of change. And, uh, and for me, that's, that's the hope, the, the hope of planting that seed. That's lovely. Dwayne, last word yeah, to you. One of those. I think for me, hope is all about just 
wanting somebody to look at the world and say, actually, that's my responsibility. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether they're 90 years old or nine years old. I want everyone going forward to look at the world outside and say, that's partly my responsibility. That's really great. Well, I have to say that you have all made me feel unbelievably more hopeful as a result of spending an hour in your company. So I hope I see you all again. And uh, just to say thank you very much. Please buy Tori's book. I think the details are probably in the chat. And I thank Claire and Tori and Phoebe and Dwayne for giving us their time this evening. It's been fantastic to meet you and talk to you. So just keep going, guys. Keep going. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you and good night. Thank you. It was great to work well, with you. Thank you, you too. <laughs>